Um, well, if you'd like to go ahead and open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, if you're using one of the church Bibles, it's on page 761. Um, if you'd like to follow along, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, please be patient with me this morning. I'm using a handheld, so if it wavers from my mouth, I'll do my best to keep it nearby. Um, and just as you turn there, we're about to read it in a moment. Um, we're, we're jumping back into our series uh, in Sermon on the Mount called Kingdom Living, how, how real disciples live under Jesus' rule, and thinking about what heart deep obedience looks like. And we thought last week about how two things particularly reveal where our hearts are, um, how we use our money, and how we deal with the concerns and cares of this world of anxiety, which is what we're thinking about this morning. And just as you finish turning there, um, a couple of resources on the weekly email. Um, I've continued to kind of compile a bit of a, a resource list. Basically, things for your heart as we work through some kind of significant and maybe difficult topics in this series. And a couple there on anxiety, if this is something you particularly struggle with. Um, a kind of longer devotional book called Anxiety Knowing God's Peace which is kind of a 31-day devotional, little, little daily devotionals to really help you think that through and to grow in that. And then a very short booklet called Overcoming Anxiety by David Powelson. I encourage you, if this is a significant issue for you, um, to maybe uh, think about uh, getting those. If you don't know how to get them, come and speak to me. I'd love to be able to help you with that. Um, but those would be really helpful. And maybe there's something you can give to a, a friend or family member who struggles with this issue. Um, they they will, will find them helpful. So Matthew chapter 6. Um, verses 25 to 34, I'm going to read them, uh, and then I'm going to pray for us. Hear the word of God. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look around at the birds of the air, and they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let me just pray for us. Father, we thank you um, that you speak to us through your word. We thank you that you speak into every area of our lives. and. We pray now as we come before your word uh, with whatever condition our hearts are in that your spirit would pierce it change it transform it father that you would soften our hearts and make us receptive to hear and to respond in obedience and faith father please in these moments fill our hearts with certainty uh, with joy as we look to jesus in your word in his name we pray amen um, so I, I got a phone call at the end of this week uh, from the car mechanic and it's, uh, it's never good when the car mechanic tells you to make sure you're sitting down before he tells you uh, what the bill's going to be. We've all been there, right? Um, and there's that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, concern or your heart begins to sink when you hear things like that, right? He, here we go, big bill, where's the money going to come from? Uh, I'm not telling you that to try and uh, make you uh, pity me. But that's a real life example, a kind of very ordinary example of how often we respond when we hear things like that. And there's lots of things that can make us worry, isn't there? Uh, money and material things, maybe food and clothing, energy bills in this season, our mortgage, car, maybe it's job security. But those aren't the only things. Maybe our health makes us anxious, uh, relationships or, or lack of or difficulty of relationships makes us anxious, or maybe we're even anxious for our very safety. What should we do about our worry and anxiety? Uh, well, uh, we could do what the, the, the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, tells us to do, if you know that song. Do you know it? Yeah. Bobby McFerrin's, my brother's just cringing in the front row as I whistle there. Um, yeah, I, should, I wouldn't sing it very well. He says, don't worry, be happy. Just be happy. 
Uh, and that catchy song really kind of captures in many ways, I know, I know it's kind of trivial or maybe seems simplistic, but it does kind of capture in many ways the, the shallowness ultimately of the solutions that this world offers us when it comes to anxiety and worry. Think positive thoughts. Be happy. Society solutions, when we look around, well-intentioned as they are, are ultimately too simplistic, if we're honest about it, and they don't offer lasting solutions. Lasting solutions. Ultimately, when it comes to our anxiety and worry, we need more than just good advice. We need good news, and Jesus gives us that here this morning. Jesus, in his grace, has something to say to our anxiety. Really, the Jesus and the gospel and God's word has something to say to every aspect of that we struggle with in life. It's big enough to deal with all the difficulties we face. He has something to say specifically this morning about our anxiety and worry. He has something to say because at its root, anxiety is not primarily a psychological, social, or biological issue. It's primarily a soul issue. It's primarily a spiritual issue. It's a faith issue. It's a matter of our hearts. And not our organ, the heart, of course. The Bible talks about our heart as the seat of our will and our emotions and our affections. It's a faith issue. It's a heart issue. Jesus cares about our anxiety. He knows what's going on in our hearts and our lives. And he hasn't left us to figure it out on our own. That's the good news this morning. And he gives us much more than a simplistic answer of don't worry, be happy. He points us to something substantial that gets right to your heart. He doesn't just tell us how to manage our anxiety. He points to a much more eternal, hopeful, transformative, and lasting solution to those feelings and emotions. It's this, is to look to our Heavenly Father in faith. So let me ask you this morning, and in many ways it's a bit of a silly question, because we all struggle with it, are you anxious? Are you anxious? Well, if you're a Christian here this morning, Jesus is addressing his disciples. So as a reminder for Christians that we are not immune to these things. It shouldn't surprise us, even as Christians, that we struggle with this. But it also shouldn't be defining of us because we have a Heavenly Father to look to in faith. Maybe you don't know Jesus this morning or you're exploring that or figuring that out. Let me encourage you to see how anxiety points to the fact, your anxiety and worry points to the fact that this world and our lives are not what they should be. They are not what we would hope them to be. Yet only God and what he has revealed in his word can give you any real, concrete, eternal answers to that. And ultimately, I pray that you would see that anxiety is a heart issue. As creatures created by God who live in his world, it's a God issue. It's a faith issue. True, lasting relief from anxiety will only come when we turn to Jesus in faith. And maybe it's helpful for all of us to ask, and maybe you think this, why does society seem so anxious nowadays? Why is it that everyone's so anxious? Why is it in the West, when we are probably wealthier and healthier than we ever have been in our history, is anxiety so rampant? You ever ask that question? Is it a coincidence that this is true of us at a time when the West in particular has so significantly turned its back on Jesus and his teaching? And how the West, and not just out there, but in here too, if we're honest, how we have sought to form our identities outside of him. Uh, the author and church historian Carl Truman in his book, Strange New World, which kind of tries to explain how we got where we are, he says this, he kind of diagnoses the reason because we don't know who we are anymore. And maybe it's helpful to put it this way, we don't know whose we are anymore. But Jesus reminds us whose we are this morning. He calls us to do this, to look to our Father in faith, and focus on his kingdom to overcome our anxiety. That's really the big idea this morning, to look to our Father in faith and focus on his kingdom to overcome our anxiety. So the first thing we see this morning together is this, in the midst of anxiety, Jesus gives my heart someone greater to put my faith in. Verse 25 to 30. Verse 25, we'll see Jesus tell us, we see Jesus tell us in verse 25, do not be anxious. And he does that three times in this passage, verse 25, verse 31, verse 34. Verse 25 begins with a therefore, which tells us we need to look back to see what he said before in order to fully understand what's going on here. He's linking us back to what he's already said about money, which we thought about last week. Money is a significant source of anxiety, isn't it? 
Money's tightly tied into anxiety here. And really what Jesus is saying is if money masters us, if we're greedy, if we allow money and possessions to define us, then our anxieties will be multiplied. Money is our master, our anxieties will multiply. But if we serve God, therefore we do not need to be anxious. That's what Jesus is teaching here. When we use the resources God has given us in the wise and godly ways he calls us to, then we will have less reason to be anxious. But Jesus isn't just saying here, okay, don't, don't read this as Jesus being just like, stop it. Don't be anxious. Hey, don't do that. I don't think that's the tone here. He graciously gives us a solution to your anxiety. He gives us someone greater that is God to put our faith in. We need to look to someone greater than ourselves or to those around us. That's what so often we do, isn't it? When life gets difficult, we become anxious. We look inside. We look to someone around us. But Jesus is saying you need to look outside of yourself. You need to look to someone greater than yourself, to God. We need to look to someone who can give us eternal guarantees in, in amidst our anxiety. And that's what he's helping us to do. And he does that by asking a bunch of kind of rhetorical questions. In doing that, he's trying to change our perspective. Our heads are often down when we're anxious. Jesus is trying to lift our heads up. He's trying to show us how foolish anxiousness really is. And he's seeking to highlight that ultimately anxiety flows from amnesia about who God is in your life. And here's a bunch of reasons. Here's a bunch of truths he gives us to remind us of who God is. Firstly, in verse 25, God made me for more. In our anxiety, we often think that we would be okay if we just had more of this. If we had more time, if we had more money, more clothes, more things. Jesus is saying in verse 25, life is more than that. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Don't be fooled into thinking that more and better money and material possessions will make you less anxious. It won't. It might kind of seem like that for a little season, but ultimately it won't make you happy. And he's saying here, God has made you for more. He's guaranteeing here, if he gives me life, if God gives you life, if he keeps the breath in your lungs, then he will also give you what you need to keep living. God's made me for more, but, and also verse 26, God values me. If you look down verse 26, Look, he tells us to look around at the birds. Maybe you can hear some of the birds on the roof this morning. Look around at the birds. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Birds, if you think about it, they don't grow their own food. You don't see birds in the field kind of plowing and sowing and reaping. They just take what's already there, what God has graciously grown. If they don't need to work for their food, if God feeds them, how will he not also feed us? those created in his image and who are so valued by him. We're so much more valuable than them. If he provides for them, then he'll provide for us. God made me for more. God values me. God is in control of me. Verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Loved ones, here's the reality. Anxiety doesn't add anything to our lives. There is no benefit to anxiety doesn't add anything. It's fruitless. Instead, we should rest in reality that our days are in God's hands. We can't add to them. Our days are in God's hands. Rest in that. Job 12, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Psalm 139 verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed of me, when as yet there was none of them. Your days are already decided. Worrying doesn't add to those or take them away. The Lord has you in his hand. God made me for more. God values me. He's in control of me. And God provides for me. That's what we see in the second picture he gives us here in these verses. That Jesus gives us that of the lilies in the field. Look how God covers them. Look how they flower. Look how they grow. Look how God covers them and grows them, even though they are so temporal. They're here today and gone tomorrow. How will he not also provide for us when we are created to be eternal? God covers and cares for and provides for the most temporal aspects of our creation. How will he not also provide for us as creatures? 
And then Jesus gets right to the heart of anxiety at the end of verse 30, if you look down. O you of little faith. What's lacking here is not money and possessions, it's faith. Jesus highlights that anxiety is a symptom of small faith. Now before you uh, begin to feel guilty, or maybe even get angry at the fact that I just said that, let's just step back for a second and consider a few things. Okay, Jesus is not out to guilt us here. It's not as intention. Jesus isn't guilting us here. He is highlighting our lack of faith so that we might turn to him in faith. He's highlighting our lack of faith in order to help us turn to him in faith and experience his grace. Another thing to maybe note is this, that we live in a sinfully broken and fallen world. So yes, care and concern are natural responses to the chaos around us. It would be strange if difficult things happened and we didn't in some way feel concerned or express care. And also we see in the New Testament that not all anxiety, not all care and concern is wrong. Paul talks about his anxiety for the churches. He has a deep care and concern for them, a longing for them to walk and mature in their faith. It's maybe helpful then to distinguish between care and concern and anxiety. The kind of anxiety Jesus is talking about here and that so often defines our heart, if we're honest, is an anxiety that effectively says, God doesn't value me. God isn't in control. God won't provide for me. That's the kind of anxiety Jesus is talking about here. The author Robert Jones helpfully um, says it this way. He says, anxiety is care and concern that gets out of control. There's a right kind of care and concern, but anxiety is care and concern that gets out of control. Virtually every expression, it continues, virtually every expression of worry begins with some legitimate concern that we allow to consume us. We, we feel to bring that concern into God's presence in order to see it from God's perspective. Worries are typically matters of concern that we feel to deal with in godly ways. Our matters of legitimate concern cross the line and become matters of sinful worry, anxiety, or fear. And in crossing the line then into anxiety, we, we, you and I are essentially choosing to reject and not rest in the truth of who God is. That's ultimately what we're doing, and that's sin. Hey God, I, we're basically saying, hey God, I'm in charge. I can fix this. Someone else can fix this. You're not in control. That's essentially what our anxiety is saying. The way back to, to rest is to turn away from our sin. It's to repent of that. Repentance is the means by which we turn from those kind of futile ways of thinking and then turn to the truth of who our Father is. That's really what God, Jesus is calling us to do here. He's saying, hey guys, you can turn to me in faith. We shouldn't review repentance here then as, as punishment, but as a pathway to peace. That's what he's saying to us here. Repentance here is a pathway to peace. It's getting rid of those lies and desires that are gripping our hearts. It's saying, God, I recognize those things aren't, that those things aren't true, that they're not worthy of my anxiety, and I'm turning away from them and turning to, to Jesus in faith. Repentance and faith here are the pathway both to eternal life and everyday earthly peace of mind. The good news is that we don't have to do that on our own, but in the strength of the Spirit and in our weakness, saying to God, I believe, help my unbelief. Because we all struggle with that, don't we? We all struggle to have faith. We all struggle to trust God. The good news is that the Spirit is within us, helping us in our weakness to, to turn back to God in faith and to say, I believe, help my unbelief. And the good news is that Jesus has come to deal with our sin to remove our guilt and shame, and to grant us eternal peace with God. God's response to our anxiety and the sinful broken world in which our anxiety is often amplified is not to guilt us, but to give us Jesus. Romans 8.32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God does not come down hard on us or guilt us because we struggle to trust and believe. He gave us his own son. And if he give us a son, how will he not also graciously give us all things that we need? When our faith is in Jesus, we can have certainty that all these things will be added to us. Even when at times our faith is small, 
because our faith is not in ourselves, is it? Even when our faith is small, we can be certain because of Jesus that God will give us all these things. Because of Jesus, God does not withhold anything necessary from us. Because of Jesus, we have a Father who graciously, tenderly, and lovingly sees our need and provides for it. So what are we to do in response to what Jesus is highlighting here? These truths about God, the nature of our faith. Well, we are firstly to renew our minds. We're to renew our minds through prayerfully meditating on these truths about God. Because that's where so much of our anxiety comes from. We believe lies about God. We believe lies about ourselves in this world. We need to renew our minds. We're to take every thought captive to Christ. We're to do what we sang about just a moment ago. We're not to be formed by feelings, but to hold fast to what is true. That's what we get to do. That's what we need to do in the strength of the Spirit. We feed our hearts with God's consolations, not the world's. Psalm 94 says this, When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. We are to renew our minds and then we're to repent. We're to turn away from these things which uh, cause us to take our eyes off of Jesus and turn back towards Jesus in faith. And the Spirit helps us to do that. We, we get rid of those things. We stick them in the bin. Those lies, those, those desires, and we turn back to Jesus in faith. We rely on God's ordinary means. So you might be thinking to yourself, how is it exactly that God provides for my everyday needs? My food and my clothes. How is it that he actually does that? It doesn't just fall from the sky, does it? It doesn't just grow on trees. Two things, hard work and generosity. God provides for us through hard work. We see that throughout the Bible, all over the place. We are to work hard with our hands. Our food and our clothing just don't fall into our lap. God calls us to, to work hard. And he also provides through, for us through the generosity of other believers and other people. If we are needy, if we are in need of material things, of the necessities of life, God, God places us in a church family where those things can be provided for. And we are to remember, we are to remember how he's provided for us in the past and in the present. Think back to a time in your life where you were anxious, where you were worried. Think back to how God has always met your necessities, how he's always met your needs. And take heart that he will continue to do that in the future. And a big one, a big one for us in how we're to respond to this text is to pray. To pray to God. It's no coincidence that the Lord's Prayer is so close to this passage. The Lord's Prayer really reorders our anxious hearts and helps us to make requests. It gives us they give us this day our daily bread. It's encouraging us to go to God with our anxious needs. And we're going to see that next week in Matthew 7. God invites us in the midst of our anxiety and our uncertainty to ask him for what we need. And when we do that, he will give us what we need. That's the promise. So often we forget that. So often we're prayerless. So often we're faithless. But God says, come to me in faith and ask and I'll give you all that you need. 1 Peter 5 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he might exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. He is mighty. He is strong. He is God. Stop carrying your anxieties yourself. Cast them on him, because he cares for you. Philippians 4, The Lord is at hand. There's an important reminder in the midst of anxiety. Often anxiety makes us feel alone, doesn't it? Philippians 4 reminds us that we're not alone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lastly, maybe important point of application when it comes to anxiety, don't do it alone. Don't deal with it alone. You have the spirit within you, take it to God in prayer, but do it with other people. Walk with other people in this church. Let them go to God with you and for you in your anxieties. Let them pray for you. Let them pray with you. Let's be generous to one another in the midst of those anxious needs. And let's speak these truths to, in love to one another's lives. We need that so often. We don't need to carry the burden and anxieties that so often trouble us. Instead, we can turn in faith to God 
we can cast them onto him. Why are we carrying these things on our shoulders, loved ones? Cast them onto him. Let him carry them. He's greater than us. He is worthy of our belief and worship. Jesus gives us someone greater to do that. Jesus gives us someone greater than ourselves to put our faith in. And he also gives us something greater to focus on. That's the second thing we see in this passage. In the midst of anxiety, Jesus gives my heart someone greater to put my faith in. And secondly, something greater to place my focus on. Verses 31 to 34. Really at the heart of these verses, 31 to 34, and really at the heart of this passage is the exhortation to do this, to seek first the kingdom of God. So often we are consumed with and crippled by this life, by this world, by building our own little kingdoms at the expense of focusing on the world that's to come, on eternal life and the kingdom that God's establishing. Jesus here is trying to change our focus. God's kingdom is what we're to focus on. That's what we're to put first. We're to seek it first. We're to prioritize it. And it will free us when we do that from the things which, which so often cripple our hearts. How can we focus on the kingdom then? Because God frees us up to do that. He tells us that when we focus on his kingdom, he will give us all that we need. End of verse 32. And he will give us all that we need to live for him. All these things will be added to us. We're freed up to focus on God's kingdom because he gives us all the necessities of life in order to do that. Why should we focus on his kingdom? Well, if you've spent time in Matthew throughout these last few years, you'll know why. Because that kingdom has arrived. That kingdom has arrived in Jesus. Remember, he, he began the gospel of Matthew with repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's why we should focus on it. It's here. It's not a distant reality. It's a, it's a present reality. It requires a response. Jesus called for that response. It demands our allegiance. The Lord's Prayer encourages us to consider that. Your kingdom come. That kingdom is being established. Now, through God's rule and reign in our hearts and through the church, and one day that kingdom will come down to earth. That's why we should prioritize it. That's why we should focus on it. And that kingdom is a matter of eternal life and death. Our membership of that kingdom is a matter of eternal life and death. And being part of that kingdom will bring you and I eternal life, joy, peace, and justice. That's how we focus. That's why we focus. And when we grasp that and give our lives to that, we gain perspective. When we seek his kingdom first, we gain perspective. We will increasingly be at peace and we will be less anxious. Anxiety doesn't disappear overnight. No one's pretending that. Jesus doesn't pretend that either. It's a lifelong pro process of turning from uh, lies we would believe and turning back to God in faith. But we can, with God's grace and the Spirit's help, become increasingly less anxious. And see what impact we as Christians can have in the world around us. If you look down at verse 32, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. What he's basically saying there is that even the Gentiles worry about these things. When we're anxious, Jesus is saying, we're just like everybody else in the world. Yet as Christians, we should be the least anxious people in our towns and our communities. Doesn't mean we'll, we'll never be anxious. Doesn't mean we won't wrestle with that and that we can't wrestle with that honestly. But as Christians, we should be, we get to be the least anxious people in our towns and our communities. And what could be more impactful in the culture that we live in today than people who have a confidence and a certainty in the midst of distressing circumstances? What, what better way potentially could we be salt and light in our world today than by being people who are increasingly less anxious? The world needs to see humble, holy, hopeful, worshipful, prayerful, non-anxious Christians. And yes, we're, we're still going to struggle with it. It's not that we'll never struggle with it or that it's a struggle we need to be ashamed of. We can be honest about that, but we don't need to stay there. And we get to, to show people how they don't need to stay there either when they turn in faith to God and experience his everlasting peace. Maybe a couple of things just to really kneel down here and apply. How do we actually seek first the kingdom of God? So Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Okay. What does that look like in everyday life? Well, it's this. It's obeying all of Jesus' commands. And you're like, that's a lot. Yeah. 
that takes a lifetime to figure that out and to work that out, right? It's obeying all of Jesus' commands. It's obeying his teaching here in Matthew 5 to 7, which is a significant chunk of his commands. It's making joyful worship and obedience to Jesus a priority in our lives and the lives of those around us. So what we're doing here this morning is seeking first the kingdom of God. What the guys in the room over there are doing is seeking first the kingdom of God as they invest gospel truth in the lives of our kids. And when we do that, verse 33 tells us, God will give us what we need. Sometimes we read that and we don't actually realize what God's saying there, what Jesus is saying there. Jesus is saying, if you seek first the kingdom, I'll take care of everything. And that brings us to the end of verse 33. What are all these things? Well, in context, all these things are food and clothing. That's what he's been talking about, isn't it? It's the necessities of life. The necessities of life. It's not all the things you might want or would like. And you've maybe heard people say, or you've said it yourself, and you know, and I count myself in that category, you know, if you get this bit right, see if you get this bit right, see if you first, seek first the kingdom of God, everything else will fall into place. You'll get the job you want, you'll get the family you want, you'll get the kids you want, you'll get the car you want. Speak to someone who's been a Christian long enough and they will tell you that's not how it works. It's not how it works. God will give us all the things we want. He will give us all the things we need. We'll get what we need in order to live out the good works God has prepared for us as long as he puts breath in our lungs. We need to treat that verse carefully. It's not all the things we would want. It's all the things that we would need in order to live out the good works God has prepared for us. And the good news is, the good news is that what we need which God will give us is always what is best for us and will bring eternal happiness to our lives. I've been reading through Revelation uh, recently just in my own personal reading and uh, as I was preparing this passage it made me think of the church in Smyrna, Revelation 2. Um, John writes to seven different churches and I was kind of thinking how they would have read these verses in Matthew 6. Here's the letter that was written to them by John. I know your tribulation and your poverty. They were poor. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear, in many ways the same exhortation, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let me hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Here's what Matthew 6 means to them. God will give you everything you need to endure a faithful death. Seeking first the kingdom of God means that the second death that it talks about there, second death, death and hell, will not hurt us and that we have all we need to live for God until the day we face our first death here on earth. <clears throat> and maybe you're, maybe you're not a Christian or you're figuring that out or you're still exploring that and you think to yourself, I'm not a Christian but I still seem to have plenty of things. I haven't got my faith in God but I still seem to have all these things. Let me encourage you to make no mistake that the reason you have any of these things is because of God's common grace. The fact that the sun rises, that rain falls on the crops, enabling you to eat and to clothe yourself is because of his common grace. So it is from God, even though you maybe don't recognize that. And the reality is that without God in our lives, our lives will be out of place. When we do not seek and focus on his kingdom first, our lives will eventually show up the fact that they are out of place and that we are traveling on a path that ends with meeting God only as our judge and not also as our father. In love, it doesn't have to be that way. The call is to turn to Jesus in faith and seek his kingdom. So with the eternal perspective in mind that the kingdom of God 
What about the day-to-day? -day? One question I often ask um, when I'm uh, preparing to, to preach to you guys is this. What impact does this passage have on our Monday mornings? What impact should this passage have on our Monday morning? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 34. He kind of really helpfully narrows this down into a simple, achievable, day-to-day -day reality. Verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So here's the answer to that question. How does this impact your Monday morning? Um, it shouldn't quite yet. Don't worry about your Monday morning just yet. You've still got half a day to go. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't worry about your Monday morning just yet. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's the reality, isn't it? There's enough to deal with each day. It doesn't mean we don't plan. Okay, this, this verse is not an excuse to never plan or never to think ahead. It's just that we, when we plan, we plan in a way that realizes our life doesn't depend on our plan, right? We make plans but we plan in a non-anxious way that realizes that ultimately it's, everything is in God's hand. We do what the author David Paulson helpfully says in that little book that I recommended at the beginning. He says this, remember your step of obedience will always be smaller than the problem. And that's so often what makes us more anxious, isn't it? We have a big problem, we have a big concern, uh, and we think to ourselves, how do I fix that whole problem? Instead, we should think about the small steps of faithful obedience that would lead up to anything happening. He goes on to say, in every area of your life where there is trouble, God is calling you to a small step of faith and love. He's not calling you to solve what is wrong. So if you're job hunting, you can pray for God to provide. It's a simple thing you can do. Or you can pray for someone beside you who's looking for a job. You can't magic up a job, but you can patiently make one application at a time you can be honest in your application. Don't fabricate it. You can be willing to do humble work. You might not get the job you'd like, but you should be willing to do, we should be willing to do humble work. And we should be a good employee, even in the small things. So if we're looking to move jobs and we're going into our existing job on Monday morning, just keep being a good worker. Keep being faithful, small steps of faith. Maybe we're anxious about our kids. Here's the truth, we can't change them or control them, no matter how much we'd like to. We can't change them or control how they'll turn out, but we can pray for their heart tonight. We can pray for them tonight. We can love them throughout the rest of this day. We can teach them little bits of truth from God's word every day. Maybe we're anxious about money. Again, we can pray. It's a small, simple, but powerful thing we can do today. We can pray for God to provide. We can go about making wise, simple, daily decisions about our money, about how we use our money. We can make simple, wise decisions about maybe having to downsize to make some spending cuts. And we can be honest, maybe even over tea and coffee right now, about our needs. Small, simple steps of obedience. And then we can go to bed tonight and lie our heads down on the pillow of God's good, providential provision and care. Reminding ourselves that he knows better than anyone what we need and that when our faith is in Jesus, the one who never lacked faith in God, in him, God will always meet our needs. So that's what we're called to do this morning, to look to our Father in faith and focus on his kingdom to overcome anxiety. Ultimately, we're to look to Jesus, the one who the Father sent as the ultimate expression of his provision. How do we know God provides? Give me an example, Lee. Jesus. Jesus, his own son, who meets our deepest need of salvation through the cross. When we turn from our unbelief and turn in faith to Jesus, we are credited with Jesus' perfect faith. We get adopted into God's family and we get access along with Jesus to our Heavenly Father who will always give us what we need in order to do His will. So let's focus on living for Him, serving His kingdom, choosing to anchor our hearts in His promises rather than straying into anxiety. 